a good prayer to offer at any time, but especially as we come to the Word of God this evening. I invite you to turn in the Scriptures to Luke chapter 8. The Gospel of Luke chapter 8. chapter 8, we want to read from verse 1. We looked at these verses, the opening verses, last Lord's Day evening, but we will read again from verse 1 through the end of verse 15. What we will consider tonight will be familiar to many of you, but may the Spirit of God keep it from being lost on any of us. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, let's hear the word of the Lord from verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the Word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the Word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares, and riches, and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that, on the good ground, are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit, with patience. Amen. May the Lord bless His infallible Word to our hearts. May we be taught of God. May we be built up in our faith. Let's pray again. Seek the Lord for that help. And I trust every believer knows that you need help. The preacher needs help. We all need the help of God when we come to the Word. We do pray, Lord, that Thou wilt break the bread of life to us. It's an appropriate prayer at this moment, that Thou wilt break the bread of life. We recognize the need for sovereign intervention, the need for Thy power to be manifest, to be revealed, to be known and experienced as we consider the precious Word of God. So there's an act of faith, even now, where every believer looks heavenward, and we depend on Thee to make good use of Thy Word in our lives. Grant it, Lord, we pray. Thou knowest what we need. Take the preacher from a mere experience of uttering forth his notes. Make this a message from God, and we pray for conversions. 
We pray for the salvation of any that may be lost here tonight. Thou knowest their hearts. Thou seest them. Thou art fully aware of their unbelief. But it is nothing to Thee. Give help now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For those that were not here last time, as we consider verses 1 through 3 of Luke chapter 8, we considered what I basically put before you, that this is a bird's eye view of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Galilee. It's not intended to reflect to us a one-time event where the Lord Jesus on one particular occasion went throughout every city and village, but it is this 30,000 foot view of the Savior's ministry during that time. And Luke is introducing this section by, by just presenting this, this general view of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout Galilee on these occasions at this present time of His ministry. But what he does afterwards is he hones in on a particular event, a very important event. In fact, the telling of a parable that is recorded for us also in Matthew and Mark. It is the well-known parable that is called the parable of the sower, which isn't so much about the sower. Certainly the sower is uh, important. In fact, the sower would be the Lord Jesus Christ in this. But it is not so much focusing upon Him as it is focusing upon our Savior in terms of his ministry. By this time, our Savior has amassed a significant, significant following. Verse 4 tells us, And when much people were gathered together and were come to, hear, come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. And if you go to Matthew and Mark, you will see again this emphasis on the, the magnitude of the crowd that gather. In fact, on, in, in those uh, Gospels, we are told, in fact, that it happens by the Sea of Galilee, and he gets into a boat, and he moves out, and it appears that he creates this kind of nat natural amphitheater by being on the boat in a lower level, and the rest of the people all gathering around to hear him, and there is huge crowd that assemble to hear our Lord Jesus speak on this occasion. The influence, therefore, of his ministry has moved the people to the point that they feel they, they must be where he is. His miracles had captured their imaginations, and many were willing to sacrifice their time and attention for the opportunity to see something supernatural. And I emphasize the supernatural because of the parable. Because the parable is really, in one sense, a lament that in this huge congregation, in this massive group of people, they were not all receiving the Word in the same way. The motivation, therefore, of the various individuals that had gathered on this occasion must be put in question. They are there, I suggest to you, to see something supernatural, to see a miracle, to see someone else raised from the dead or some other blind person receive their sight or whatever it may be on a given occasion. The region of Galilee was where Christ performed the majority of His mighty works. And of course, miracles that people were looking for in order to persuade them to believe that He was and is the Messiah, they got it. They got it in abundance. Many miracles were performed. And so the significance of this parable is that it really functions as a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ pronouncing His experience in His ministry in Galilee. This is what it's been like for Him as He has went. Again, look at verse 1. He went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. He's been moving around, exercising this uh, ministry, this itinerant ministry, going from place to place, pouring his heart into the people, communicating to them the Word of God. And Luke records at this point then, stepping back and giving an indication into how the Lord viewed and testified to his experience in preaching the Word. That makes it very significant. The Lord Jesus is presenting here, making a connection here between His time of laboring and preaching the gospel and the response of the people. 
As we've said, the sower is Christ. The seed is his ministry of the word. The ministry he has conducted again in verse 1. But that is not the focus of the parable. The focus is on the soils. It's on the various grounds that are presented. Now, when you think about the parables, the Lord Jesus used many parables, and sometimes they had a very narrow focus in terms of their application. The Lord had a, a certain group of individuals, very specific people in mind when he was communicating a parable. And on some of those parables, therefore, if I was preaching on them tonight, there may be a few of you, maybe many of you, and you wouldn't really feel the full weight of that parable or of the, 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 the purpose behind the parable because it's not really directed at where you are. It's not that there would be no application. I trust there would be some application, but, but it would be so formed, so delivered, so particular to a certain group that it may not directly relate to you and where you are. But this parable, this parable applies to everyone. You can't escape this parable. Every single person here tonight, every single person has to come face to face with the parable that is before us in Luke chapter 8. This parable, as we said, is commonly called the parable of the sower. It is relevant to everyone. Each one of us can find ourselves in, in one of the grounds that are mentioned. And it is your task, your task, not mine, your task to determine where do I fit in. The sower goes about his business indiscriminately. He casts the seed where it may fall. That's the preaching of the Lord Jesus and all those who engage in a similar ministry. It is not the job of the preacher to scrutinize the hearts of men to determine what ground they are. He gives the word. But the purpose of the parable is that the people hearing could examine their own hearts, look at their own lives, and try to honestly answer before God, which ground am I? So you've, you've work to do tonight. <laughs> I have the work of communicating more fully what this parable is all about. But you have something to do before you leave. You have to come to a solid understanding what ground reflects me. So tonight we're considering an analysis of the human heart, an analysis of the human heart, because that's what each of the ground, the grounds represent, the hearts of men. And as we look at these verses, verses 4 through 15, I want you to note with me, first of all, that the Savior illustrates, the Savior illustrates in verses 5 through 8. We will later see how the disciples investigate and then the Savior illuminates, but tonight, but pardon me, verses eight, 5 through 8, we see the Savior illustrating. And let's read these verses again. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So he tells a parable. The word parable is common to many of you. It's a transliterated word from the Greek. It's a compound word in the original made up of the word para, meaning alongside of, like we might say parallel, and the other word being balo, which means to throw in Greek. And so the sense of the word is that you're throwing something beside something. The parable then is throwing a story, throwing the parable alongside a truth, that the, the story is told in connection to a truth, is put alongside it. And so whenever you hear a parable, the point isn't, oh, that's a nice parable. The point is, well, well, what's the truth? It's like we said this morning. Don't miss the main point. Don't miss the emphasis. Don't get bogged down in the details of the parable wondering, well, well, well what's, what's this? I mean, you could even ask the question, who's the sower? And so on and so forth. And it's not irrelevant. 
But it isn't the main thrust of the message. It's not, it's not the heart of the message. So the, a parable is given. It's a story that is told. But alongside that, thrown beside it, is a truth that everyone is meant to understand. The question is, do we? A sower went out to sow his seed. This scene is one that would have been common back then, but not for us today. Agrarian life 2,000 years ago isn't quite like agrarian life today, especially in somewhere like America. There are parts of the world, many parts of the world, in fact, where there hasn't been a whole lot of change. There have been many changes, but it hasn't been as dramatic as it is in places like America or Australia. Other lands that are huge, vast lands where when you start talking about farming, your idea of farming are these almost endless fields of corn with these massive combines that no one can really afford except these massive corporations because it costs millions and millions of dollars. That's your idea of farming. That's farming in, in modern life in America. But <laughs> that's really not what farming's like in most parts of the world. Even in Northern Ireland, I mean, the average farmer might own about 200 acres, not these you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 acre farms or more. And when you go to less developed or less uh, prosperous countries, you will find that there are still many places where uh, life is kind of like what it was years ago. You know, if you were go, to go somewhere like Armenia or certain parts of Eastern Europe, you will find that many people have these, these little farms, these little plots, and they grow their own uh, food. And it, it's, it's kind of similar to life as it has been for, for many, many years. Well, back in those days, when people would live in towns and cities, outside those towns and cities would be strips of land that would be lots allocated to the people. And each person was responsible for these various lots, but, but you can see the scene because they had to divide the land up and, and create little paths alongside, which is where you get the whole sense of the wayside. You get these, these narrow paths where the, where the, the individual sowing the seed would, would, would always walk along the very same place, and others may be sowing on the other, seat, other side at the various times, and by that you beat down the ground. It becomes very hardened and, and almost like rock. It becomes a path. Well, that's the, the scene that is here presented by the Lord Jesus. When he says a sower went out to sow his seed, the idea is he left his town, he left his village, he went out of some place in Galilee, Capernaum or whatever, and he went out to his little plot and he sowed his seed, just like all of you. And the people who are standing before the Lord Jesus would be very familiar with this. This, this is what we do. So he heads out and some fell by the wayside and so on and so forth. The wayside, as I've said, are those paths that would be used in order to reach various parts of the land. You have to walk up these strips so you're not trotting on the very place where you intend to throw the seed, but inevitably seed go, ends up there. And we're told that fowls of the air come and devour it. In fact, it might not be too much uh, to imagine that the fowls are always hovering there at certain times when they realize, oh, there they go. You, you will know that birds, birds learn the patterns of humans. They learn the habits of of others where they can get food. I, I remember to this day when it, we were at school and you had the playground and you would go out and play and it, again, the kids would be eating bags of, I was about to say crisps, potato, potato chips. <laughs> the British comes out occasionally, I have to try and suppress it to the best of my ability. But eating potato chips or whatever and some would end up on the ground and as soon as the kids were gone, as soon as they were gone, the birds came down, the seagulls, the crows, they, 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 they knew. I don't know if they were listening for the bell or they just, they, they, had, they had this certain time. They knew after the kids disappear, then we can go and we'll not be trod on. Nothing will happen. We can enjoy what has been dropped on the ground. Well, that's, I would imagine, very similar. When the farmers begin, when the individuals start to sow their seed, that the fowls of the air would see the pattern and begin to just watch and wait for him to sow the seed and then disappear and swoop down immediately to capture that seed. Verse 6 tells us some fell upon a rock as well, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some of the ground is like any ground. It doesn't always have the, the same depth that you imagine. You look at it and you think that can take seed, but, but there's a rock. There's huge rocks, large rocks, flat rocks that are just below the surface 
And so the seed then is cast on these areas and you have the problem as it's illustrated by the Lord Jesus. You have that in verse 7, which ends up among the thorns. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. These are areas where weeds or other forms of, of things that weren't intended to be growing there were there, and the seed ends up among them, and it lacks the advantage of the thorns who have been there prior to them, and so it's choked. And verse 8 then speaks of the good ground, the, the ground that will bring forth a harvest, the ground from which the crop will come. As growth is slower, you can see it fell on good ground and sprang up, but, but it doesn't spring up as quickly as the others, but it does spring up and it bears fruit in hundredfold. And the Lord Jesus then says this, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This is His declaration. Pay attention. Understand the words. Grasp the meaning. It's language intended to draw out their attention so that they realize there's something more than what's on the surface here. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He is warning them. Don't just think of this as a story about a sower who went and sowed a seed and there were various grounds upon which the seed fell. There's a meaning. There's a significance. I'm I'm telling you something here. Do you hear it? So that's the Savior illustrating here in this parable. Secondly, the disciples then investigate. The disciples investigate. Verse 9, and His disciples asked Him, saying, What might this parable be? The other accounts of this tell us that this happens alone. That they come and try to get the Lord on His own. They wait until the Lord is on His own before they investigate this way. And verse 10 says, He said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. The mysteries of the kingdom of God. Mysteries. What does He mean by mysteries? By mystery... He illustrates the fact that there are certain truths that cannot be understood unless God reveals them. Things that man cannot begin to grasp or mine out or discover without divine revelation. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. You have the distinct privilege and blessing of having these hidden truths revealed to you. To others, it comes in parables. Now you think about that for a minute. It seems very strange. It's not uncommon for classes in homiletics, and I better not go too far here with the, the homiletics professor in the building. <laughs> But it's not uncommon for people, especially those with a disposition to tell stories, to argue the case for telling stories from the parable teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told all these parables. He was always telling parables. We should tell parables. We should tell stories. We should keep people's attention by using these stories. But they miss a crucial part of what parables were all about. Parables were not the kind of thing that you find in 50,000 sermon illustrations book <laughs> to fit every occasion. I, I think I bought one of those way back when I started preaching the, one of these books of illustrations and realized they were all garbage and <laughs> I never bought another one again. Oh, I never looked near illustrations. If it comes from my own life, from my own observations, it comes, but I'm not, I'll let Mr. Wagner tell the preachers whether or not it's the right approach. But it's certainly the one I'm most comfortable with. Trying to find stories seems like a vain thing to do when you're given the task of studying the Word and preaching it. But the point is this. The parables are not something to model. In fact, without getting into too much detail, the parables were an indication 
that Jesus was the Messiah, that he would come and teach in parables, was one of the signs, not the only one, but, but one of the many signs that would indicate, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. All that, that his, his manner of teaching, this is prophesied. We should be paying attention, therefore. The parables had a dual purpose, and one that seems to be missed or not fully understood is the fact that they had the purpose of hardening the hearts of those who already were in the process of hardening themselves against the Lord. Now, this is not new. You go back to God's dealing with Pharaoh, you will find this same behavior where the one who hardens his heart against God, God begins to facilitate that hardening of heart. He gives him what he wants. You want to harden your heart? So be it. And Israel had hardened their heart against God. Israel had for generations turned away from God, distorted the truth of God. And when Jesus Christ arrives on the scene, there is still this hardness, there is this resistance, there is this lack of willingness to submit. They are hard of heart. And the parables were actually facilitating the increasing hardening of their hearts. Now, there are a few who received mercy. To them was given the blessing of knowing the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others, in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. They can see the illustration. They can see the sower. They can see him with the leather bag over his shoulder full of seed. They can see him walking up those particular wayside paths and scattering his seed across the ground. They can see the various types of soils, and they can, they can picture it all. They can see it all, but they, they can't see it. They can't see the truth. And they hear the words. They hear what's being said. They, they hear everything the Savior speaks, but they can't hear the truth that undergirds the parable. What the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here is likening His ministry to Isaiah's ministry. I think I have pointed this out before, but it needs to be pointed out again coming to a verse like verses 9 and 10 of Luke 8, because this is not new. Being given a ministry where you're presenting truth in such a fashion that people who see don't see, and people who hear you don't understand. Isaiah chapter 6, on that occasion when Isaiah is called, when he feels that, that, that call of God and he sees a vision of the glory of God, in fact, it's a vision of the Son of God, according to John chapter 12, and he sees this. He's confronted with this. And his response is complete submission. Here am I. Send me. Now, with such willingness, you imagine that surely God will, will bless this man, this holy man, this devout man, this religious man, this good man. Amidst a, a nation that has turned their back on God, you have this, this single man who's sold out for God. Surely God will bless his life, bless his ministry. He'll have all this fruit and this wonderful experience of revival. Everyone will listen to him. Souls will be saved. He'll have a great time obeying God. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what he's told. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Also, this is after he submitted. No, pardon me. This is including it. Also, I heard the voice of saying, of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I forgot I included that in. So here he is presenting himself. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. This is your ministry. Hear, but don't understand. See, but don't perceive. That's what I'm sending you to say to them. Hear me, but don't understand. See what I'm saying, but don't perceive it. 
What? So the Lord continues, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes. Shut their eyes. Why? Why? Because they've already been shutting their eyes. This is an answer to their prayer. This is their desire. They don't want to see. They don't want to hear. They don't want to understand. They don't want what you have to say. Isaiah, go and give them what they want. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Go and give them what they want, lest they should be converted. And that's what the Lord is doing here. His ministry, teaching parables, is following in the vein that he put before Isaiah. I want you to do the same thing. Isaiah got to experience the same thing that the Lord Jesus himself would do in a future day giving truth in such a fashion that man with a hard heart would not respond to the truth. Now, this was largely applicable to the Jews. This is Israel. These are the people to whom were given the covenants and the promises and the fathers, whom concerning the flesh Christ came. These are people so blessed, lavished with blessings, but they had hardened their hearts. And the problem faced by our Lord Jesus, that of Israel hardening their heart, was not one that disappeared after Pentecost. You might imagine, well, Pentecost came, 3,000 Jews were converted. Maybe that's an indication that the, that the Lord is is removing this, that this, this, this judgment, that's what it is. This judgment is going away. It was there during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the apostles didn't have to face that experience. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down. On that occasion, Peter preaches, the other preach. Thousands are being converted. Multitudes are coming to faith. This is an indication that the judgment's left, lifted. It's gone, is it? Turn for a moment to the very end of the book of Acts. The very end of the book of Acts. And this is the same human author. Luke is writing this. The same man who recorded Luke chapter 8. And this experience of our Lord Jesus and his words records for us the closing of the record of this historic this book of history. You come to Acts chapter 28. We'll look from verse 23. So here he is. The Jews are speaking against him. Verse 23 says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. So here's what he says. Here's what Paul says. These are some of the closing words of Paul's ministry recorded by Luke. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, or Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go on to this people and say, Hearing... Ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Even years later, 
the apostle conducting his ministry, reaching to the Jew first. His heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, but he has to acknowledge that during his own lifetime, his own ministry, he faced the very same thing. The same judgment, the same curse, the same unbelief still prevailed upon the Jews. So the disciples get this response from the Lord in their investigation back in Luke chapter 8. What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. And this brings us then thirdly to see the Savior, that the Savior illuminates. He illuminates. Verses 11 through 15 give illumination to the parable. The Lord is pleased to explain to His disciples more fully what this parable is all about. And it's important that they understand this parable. This is a, this is a foundational parable. You read the other accounts of this, you see this to be the case. They need to understand what this parable is all about. So He speaks plainly, verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, let's just, just stop there, because this is the point. This is the point, that the word is not given purely to inform. Now, it has an informative influence. Any communication has an informative aspect to it, but it's not purely for you to understand something and then remain the same way, just a little better educated on a matter. The Word is given, and the devil is aware, aware that the Word is given, lest they should believe and be saved. If you're here this evening and you're not saved, I want you to grasp that the giving forth of the Word has Yes, I'm trying to encourage and teach and build up the Lord's people, but it always has. It must have this aspect as well where it is given for the purpose that men might believe and be saved. These are the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God puts before you the fact that there is a king and he has a subject. And what you need to decide, what you need to wrestle with is, will I submit to the king? It's a very simple way of looking at it. These are the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The father has appointed his son to be king, to be both Lord and Christ. And men are called to submit to His authority, give their lives to His cause, surrender themselves to Him, with, of course, the benefit that He, in giving Himself upon the cross, lavishes upon them the certainty of their salvation and their sins being forgiven. But there is a call to submit to the King, to be given entirely to the King. I want you to think about that. It's, I think... It's very difficult for us in these days when we are so far removed from days of monarchy. What it meant to live under a monarch whose word was the last thing. It was, it was the, the, the fundamental rule. You don't question the king's word. You don't argue with the king. What the king says goes. You will suffer with your life if you should question it. And let me just say, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> there's only something wrong with that when it goes against God. For a king to have absolute rule and to command his people and make known his will, there's actually nothing wrong with that. So Peter says, honor the king. Now, does the average American know <laughs> what that's like? No, 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 no. We, the people, 
I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to will a monarchy on you. But I think, and, and even today, I mean, most of the monarchies that still exist, they're, they're kind of just symbols of some ancient past that help uh, bring more tourism into the country. I mean, the royal family, people always complain about how much the royal family costs the British taxpayer. Well, they bring in far more money than, we, than is given to them because the numbers of people, the millions who come every year to stand and look at Buckingham Palace and visit the other sites are more than make up for the money that is given to Her Majesty. But even, even in Britain, we don't understand that the, the word of a king, the word of a queen, you don't question it. You don't sit there and debate whether or not you're going to obey. You act. And our Lord Jesus is presenting the mysteries of the kingdom of God. If we could just for a moment try to transport ourselves back in time to see what it was like to be under a monarch and to feel the weight of their word, it would help us to see what is asked of us before the Lord. That when he gives his word, he does not give it for you to debate about it or challenge it or question it. He gives it to you to submit to it. Let's look then at the Lord's illumination of the parable that he had given. First, we learn that men may have hard hearts. Men may have hard hearts. That's what we read in verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. So they're under the word. That's the point. The, the, the seed gets to them. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Men that have hard hearts. These are the people with whom the word has zero influence. They're the person that sits and does not really hear anything that's being said. Now, they hear it. That's what it says. They hear, verse 12, they that hear, but they don't. They don't hear at all. It comes to their ears, but it doesn't move them. They do not search their own hearts. There is zero self-examination. There is complete indifference. They either don't see their sin or when it is put before them, they simply do not care. It doesn't bother them at all. It doesn't matter whether the preacher unveils the glory of the love of God or lifts the lid off hell. They are unmoved. This is a very sad place to be. There is no response here. They hear, but you don't see them doing anything with what they hear. The devil's simply able to come and take away the word as if they never heard it at all. It was as if nothing registered. Life continues as normal. There's no, there's no interaction. There's no, they don't even contemplate. A preacher stands before them. The Lord Jesus puts these truths before individuals just as preachers put truths before such individuals today. And they don't even give consideration to it. There's no... It's like the gray matter isn't functioning, at least in relation to the Word of God. You talk about heaven, you can talk about hell. They're not sitting wondering, do I really want to go to heaven? What would it mean for me to go to heaven? What would it mean for me to neglect these truths and go to hell? What, what would it mean if, what, what if hell is real? 
I remember that's the first time I came under the word. And I went away as, as an atheist, as a professed atheist, I went away with a question, what if, what if eternity is real? Well, thank God at least my gray matter was working that much. Because there's a man standing before me, putting before me life and death. The reality that my sin will damn me. And I walk away with that thought as I can't get it out of my head. What if? What if I die without Christ? What if? What if without Christ I perish? What if? I really hope, I pray indeed, and I fear there may be some who are right here. And, and as I say again, it is, not, it is not my job to say this is you, this is your job. This is your job to determine, is this me? Do I attend church, read the Word, hear the preaching, and it never makes me think or consider or ponder or be challenged about where I am and how I'm living. Men may have hard hearts. Men may have shallow hearts. Verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. So there is a response here. They don't just hear the word, they receive the word, and they do so with joy. But they have no root. They sprang up very quickly, but there's no root. So there's no opposition here. These aren't the people who are mad at the preacher. They enjoy sermons, especially the nice ones. <laughs> but there's a lack of root. And that begins to manifest itself fairly early on. So for a while, they believe. But in time of temptation, fall away. So it just depends how long it takes for this temptation to arrive. Now, they're receiving the word with joy indicates promise, but its connection with temptation, the fact that it is temptation that moves them to fall away, shows a lack of depth in the understanding of what they've responded to. What I mean to say is, the New Testament is very plain in communicating. In fact, it's one of the primary truths that were shared and communicated with the churches and those who came to faith in Christ, it was one of the foundation, foundation truths that, were, that was shared by the apostles that you must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. I need you to get that. That's, that's the apostles. That's a summary of the apostles, Paul actually returning on his, his first missionary journey, that, that he is laying this foundation. Look, you, you must, through much tribulation, Enter the kingdom of God. There's, there's going to be tribulation. He probably warned them before he left as he makes his way back around visiting the churches. He, he, I remind you again, much tribulation. It's through much tribulation you will enter the kingdom of God. Now, what's, 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 he, what's he dealing with there? With the reality that some hear something about the gospel and respond positively to it. For example, they hear that little bit that, that their sins can be forgiven. And that sounds really good, or they hear that they can go to heaven if they just pray a prayer, repeat after me that, you know, make Jesus your Savior, pray some kind of form of prayer, and you can be sure of heaven. Well, that sounds really good, and they hear, that's all they hear. They hear that, and they respond to that, but this, this aspect of tribulation doesn't get to them. I, I see here the, the Joel Osteen hears. And I take the worst of, or one of the worst that this land has to offer in him, but he doesn't stand alone. There are many, many like him, but 
you know, those who receive the word with joy but have no time for temptation, they're the 30,000 people that go to hear Joel Osteen. They're in it for what they can get out of God. And the greatest evidence of that comes out of Osteen's mouth himself in the, in the very naming of his books. Now, this is meant to be a Christian preacher. Let me tell you what his book titles are. This is Christianity. This is 30,000 people coming to hear a Christian pastor in America. Here's how he addresses them and teaches them. Your best life now, seven steps to living at your full potential. Who's it about? What? It's about you. It's about your needs. It's about elevating. You know that joy that you experienced when you first asked Jesus into your heart? I'm trying to keep you there and ignore all the tribulation and the trial and the reality of Christian living. I'm just trying to satisfy your carnal desire for more joy. Your best life now, and it's not, it wasn't me that came up with it, but it's very true, the person who realized that never were truer words spoken by Mr. Osteen when he promised those who listen to what he has to say that their best life will be now. It will not be an eternity. Become a better you, seven keys to improving your life every day. I declare 31 promises to speak over your life. Every day, a Friday, how to be happier seven days a week. It's your time, finding favor, restoration, and abundance in your life every day. You can, you will, eat undeniable qualities of a winner. The power of I am, two words that will change your life today. Break out, five keys to go beyond your barriers and live an extraordinary life. The power of favor, the force that will take you where you can't go on your own. <laughs> and on and on it goes. Listen, these are the people, hear me now, these are the people that are always looking for an answer because they haven't found Christ. some quick fix, some silver bullet, some answer to their problems. They haven't found Christ. Eventually, some difficulty comes into their life and they fall away. Falling away may ref be reflected in different things. They may utterly deny the truth, or they, they go to a church like Osteen. They, they head to that church that will tell them how to give what they're really after because they're not really interested in Jesus Christ. These are the people that respond to the emotions of youth camps, gospel crusades, and altar calls, but they don't respond to Christ. And there's a huge market for these people. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these of no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. I hope that's not you. If there's one gift I trust the Lord gives to me, it is this that if anyone is after the kind of preaching that is about satisfying the carnal desires of men, telling them how wonderful they are and how they can be even more wonderful, I really hope the Lord gives me with the ability to speak in such a way that they are paired out of this place as quickly as possible. This is about the kingdom. Christ's preaching, go back again to verse 1. 
his preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. It's not about your kingdom. It's not about your best life now. It's not about the power of favor in your life, what you can achieve. What, what, it is about submission to the king. And if the king wants to set me in an obscure little place in the world where I'm not known and I, no one recognizes me and my gifts maybe aren't used to the maximum ability that they could be, but he wants me there, he wants me to serve in this place or in this role, that's fine. The king gets to decide. It's not about me. Thirdly, men may have cluttered hearts. They may have cluttered hearts. Verse 14 that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now, you see in a pattern here, we come to the third ground. Not one of them are genuine. Not one. And we'll get to the fourth. That's the genuine. That's the real McCoy. So, if you're having to look at these and, and think to yourself, I'm... I'm the first, or I'm the second, or I'm the third. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. These people respond. They hear. They go forth and are choked. We don't know when. It may happen immediately, or it may happen over a course of a period of time, but eventually they are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. They don't bring forth fruit to God. Their life is cluttered. They may look very promising. They may do well to begin with. I would imagine that many would fit this category, that they they start well, maybe even better than those that receive the word with joy. But as they move on, eventually Christ becomes secondary again. I'm <laughs> underlying, this is the kingdom of God, and the king will not have or accept second place in your life. So when your life becomes cluttered with cares, these can be anxieties, legitimate concerns, worries, fears, problems, aspirations unfulfilled, cares, cares of this life. Riches as well, the pursuing of riches, the accumulation of riches. The outworking of such prosperity, of course, is the pleasures of this life. Giving yourself to, to all the things that life has to offer. Accepting everything that's on display. Desiring and craving for all that the world craves for. And there may not be anything wrong with any of these things. These cares, these anxieties are legitimate anxieties. The riches, no problem with riches, no problem. And even a certain amount of the pleasures of this life, there's, no, there's nothing wrong about that. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He sat and feasted with Levi and others. Those are the pleasures of this life. It's not all wrong. The problem is it, it chokes. It chokes the Word. It chokes the Gospel. It chokes that central focus that Christ must be Lord of my life. He becomes secondary. When I was thinking and meditating on this, I thought of all the, the famous people that this may apply to. Think of those who were brought up in churches that have become famous. These are, these are the exceptional, exceptional, the extraordinary, the, the, the huge kind of famous examples, but it don't, you don't have to be as famous as this. When you think of Britney Spears, Jessica Simpson, Katy Perry, they, these, these people were brought up in the church, they, they, and, and, and someone identified they had gift, and, and they, they had some love or appreciation for the gospel, and there they were singing in the choir, 
singing solos, everybody loves it. But, but, but then, we came, then came the focus on, what can I do with this gift? And it wasn't laid at the feet of Christ. It was, hang on a minute, someone's offering me money, riches, wealth, fame, fortune, everything my heart desires. In some cases, sadly, even the parents get behind you and push it because, well, that's swift access to all the money they could ever ask for. These are extreme cases, but it is true of so many. They grow up in the church. There's an interest in spiritual things. Even some of the fallen preachers of this world would fit this category. I'll not name names, but individuals that again began with promise, handled the Word, perhaps even faithfully. Certainly they were, they were in their early days showing promise in their youth group, tr entrusted with taking Bible studies, encouraged to go to seminary, and they give themselves to this, and, and, they, and their, their gifts are utilized, and they become more and more influential, but, but then, then they're choked. And they fall away. Eventually it becomes manifest to everyone. Their hearts become enslaved to something or someone other than Jesus Christ. We are to be bond servants of Christ. And if we're not, we are in danger of drifting. Let me underline that. If you are not before God, and again, only you can answer this, if you're not in an absolutely convinced state that you are a bond servant, a slave to Christ, you are already in danger of leaving the moorings. It just takes the right current to draw you away. Finally, men may have good hearts. Verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. They have an honest and good heart. Why? <laughs> Why do they have an honest and good heart? Now, the focus of the parable is not on the matter of regeneration in terms of explicitly dealing with that subject, but this is why they have a good heart. God has done something in them. A miracle has occurred in these individuals. They have had the stony heart removed and been given a heart of flesh. And that has made all the difference. So we might say of these who have good hearts, that there's been regeneration by God. But there's not only regeneration by God, they're also preserved by God. Because when they hear the word, they keep it. And they bring forth fruit with patience. There's, there's an emphasis on keeping, sustaining, and patient fruit bearing. Now this gets even to the point we were considering this morning, doesn't it? Because this desire for immediate results, the desire to have the quick flash in the plan, Let's revolt the nation. Let's, let's take control. Let's take matters into our own hands. That is completely contrary to the fruit of the Spirit in the life of Christ's people. The evidence that they're truly the Lord's is that they keep the Word and sustain that. They maintain that keeping of the Word continually before Him and begin to bring forth fruit with patience. So they spring up and... It's not immediately. Perhaps they don't spring up as quickly as, as some of the others did. But by and by, time tells a tale. And so, they're not only regenerated by God and preserved by God, they become fruitful for God. They bring forth fruit with patience. Why do they have patience? Because it's not their kingdom they're building. Again, you go back to the days of Europe with monarchs and these people whose word, whose, whose law, whose word was the law. And when the Pope or the king or whoever it might be said, build a cathedral. And they start looking at the plans and seeing these plans and the architects looking at it, they, they 
stonemasons and so on. Saying, Hang on a minute. This, this, <laughs> this is going to take about 120 years. I won't, leave, I won't live to see the, the, the finished product of this. The king says, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Start the work. So there they are, laboring, laboring, laboring at the same building, and they die having never seen the finished product. That doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Their job was to keep laboring until they could labor no longer. And someone else comes in behind and they build it up, and it might take three or four generations, but eventually it gets built. And of course, it has this lasting legacy. It ends up being identified with the pope or king who said, give the first command. That's what he's doing. He's building his own legacy. But that's what the Lord is doing as well. He calls you into a work to be fruitful that won't build up your own little kingdom, but, but something where you'll just, you'll just labor day by day. Laboring at it. No one notices. It seems insignificant. It doesn't seem important, but, but it's important to the Lord because it's about His kingdom. And you bring forth fruit with patience. Those are the true subjects of Christ. So I come to the end and ask you again, which ground reflects your heart? Now this is serious business. Because if you're wrong in your assessment, it's the difference between heaven and hell. Of all the things you will do this week, your response to the Word of God is the most important thing you will do. So the best thing for you to do is to take a few minutes and just stop whatever else garbage or distractions are going on in your mind and just honestly, and you can sit in these pews for as long as you need, just sit there and think, which ground is me? Because you're one of them. And the first three perish. The last one belongs to Christ. There may be those here this night and you are wondering, am I the Lord's? Do I belong to Him? I can't fully answer that question for you. I read this again this afternoon and asked myself the same question. Am I really the good ground? And if I declare myself to be such, upon what basis? I hear the word and keep it. I bring forth fruit with patience. While it may not be as true as I would want it to be, I think before the Lord I can say that's what He has done in my heart. I ask you, has He done it in yours? Are you His? Let's bow together in prayer. What ground are you? Now, if you ignore that question, if it seems unimportant to you, 
then you're the first one. You're unmoved. It means nothing. May the Lord have mercy on us. Lord, I we thank Thee for Thy Word. It's a sober reminder again of the life and death nature of handling the gospel. To think that every single person here is reflected in this parable. And none of us, not one of us, can avoid being one of those spoken of. I pray, dear God in heaven, that every last one of us will be able to say, like Paul, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Lord Jesus, we pray that thou wilt help us to further submit our lives to thy kingship, and that we may keep thy word. Help us this week to keep it better, to be more resolved. Give us grace to by faith walk in thy ways, and by faith to bring forth fruit with patience. Bless each one of us, those who fellowship and go home from this place, others who will go downstairs, encourage all fellowship and interactions between each of us. Make thy presence known even as we talk with one another. Let none of our conversation distract us from the word that we have heard. Bless the food provided downstairs. Bless the, those that assemble there and be with us all this week. And there be one here without Christ. Save their precious souls. And with the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit, be with all the people of God now and evermore. Amen. Amen.